And welcome to the Sylvia Plath Symposium at Hunter College. Um, as many of you know, for Plath, this year marked the 60th anniversary of her death and the 90th anniversary of her birth year. So these landmarks seem to be, you know, the, the right time to hold a, um, you know, an all-encompassing symposium to celebrate her life, her arc, her, her, uh, her work, her um, continuing les legacy, literary legacy. And that's what we're going to do today. Um, I would like to thank um, President Jennifer Robb for her generous support uh, for this um, symposium. We would not have been able to do it without her generosity. So I'd like to thank the president of the school and Mr. Harold Holzer and his wonderful staff here at Roosevelt House who have worked tirelessly for two and a half months to bring this off. Thank you, Harold. Uh, a quick couple of announcements. Yes. A quick couple of announcements. At uh, 5 o'clock, um, we're going to have a student reading up on the, what floor is it? First floor in the, um, the FDR parlor, correct? Yes. Uh, and it's going to be a student reading. So the students, we have a student committee who's helped me out on this um, symposium you know, tremendously. They're going to they're uh, do a reading at 5 o'clock until about 5.30. Uh, you should all come. This is the next generation of Plath admirers. Uh, many of them have been my former students and present students. Uh, almost all of them have written about Plath or thought about Plath, really excellent research papers through the years here. So come hear them read. And secondly, upstairs right next to the door are some books that you can buy. Many of the authors are wandering around so you can track them down and have them sign it. And authors, if you want to go up to the desk, after the session, that's a, a good place for people to find you. So um, there will be, uh, this is the first of four panels. We'll have two morning sessions, one in the afternoon, a poets panel. And then the keynote uh, uh, tonight at 6 o'clock. Um, this panel is going to deal with Platt's work. Um, and um, the order is going to be uh, Amanda. Golden is going to cover her poetry. Uh, Peter K. Steinberg is going to cover her prose. And then Vijay Shashadri is going to, um, he's going to give his own unique interpretation of class poetry. So um, I'm going to have uh, some of my students do the introductions today. And so to introduce this panel, I would like to bring up China Slaughter, who's going to introduce them. Thank you, China. Amanda Golden is Associate Professor of English at New York Institute of Technology and a research affiliate at Smith College. She is co-editing the Poems of Sylvia Plath, a new scholarly annotated edition of Sylvia Plath's collected poems with Karen V. Kugel. This project has been supported by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Golden's monograph, Annotating Modernism, Marginalia and Pedagogy, From Virginia Woolf to the Confessional Poets, is the first extensive treatment of Plath's reading and teaching strategies, considering the contents of Plath's teaching notes and her personal library to address her engagement with language and literary history. Golden co-edited the Bloomsbury Handbook to Sylvia Plath with Anita Halley and Maeve O'Brien and edited This Business of Words, Reassessing Anne Sexton. Currently, Golden serves as Vice President of the International Virginia Woolf Society and Co-Chair of the Local Organizing Committee for the Modernist Studies Association Conference to be held in Brooklyn in October of 2023. She is the Board of Editorial Advisors for the journal Textual Cultures. Please welcome Amanda Golden. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, thank you to the students who organized, and thank you to Roosevelt House. One of the, the, one of the students is my colleague, Sabrina Polidoro's niece, and I'm so excited that this is a team effort. Um, thank you to the Plath Estate. Thank you to Faber and Faber, my co-editor, Karen V. Kukiel, Peter K. Steinberg, Smith College, Smith College Special Collections, and New York Institute of Technology. I like to get it all up, out there up front. 
Thank you for this invitation to speak at Hunter College's Plast Symposium for her 90th birthday and on the Upper East Side near, where, near what was once the Barbizon Hotel. If you haven't been by, you can go take a walk at lunch. Uh, which Platt fictionalized as the Amazon in the Bell Jar and where she lived in June of 1953. It is an incredible honor to be part of this symposium which features Gloria Steinem in its keynote event, particularly as I worked for Ms. Magazine during my senior year at Colgate University in 2001. Steinem graduated in 1956, a year after Platt did, and both studied government with the scholar Vera M Michelle Steen. In 2003, Karen V. Kukil curated the exhibition, A Story of Their Own, Virginia Woolf, Sylvia Plath, and Gloria Steinem for the 13th Annual Conference on Virginia Woolf held at Smith College. You can find this exhibition online. It included the first issue of Ms. from 1972, which published the verse play, Three Women, which Plath wrote a decade earlier. When I worked for Ms. Magazine, I also went through the kitchen cupboards, which is where the back issues were stored. And um, my mother thought that was a commentary on the role of women in the kitchen. And in the, third, <laughs> in the third issue of Ms. Magazine, there was also a lengthy piece by Harriet Rosenstein, whom some of you may know her papers and her interview notes and recordings were placed at Emory University a few years ago. And if you write to Emory, you can listen to them. They're digitized. And it's pretty amazing to hear about a decade after many of the moments take place, people recounting them. After completing my thesis on Plath's poetry at Colgate in 2001, I arrived at Smith College and began working in the archives with Karen Kukiel. On October 27th of that year, I met Paul Alexander at the Soviet Plath Day, a one-time only affair, in, in Northampton. The following, we can talk more about that later. The following fall, I met Peter K. Steinberg on the shuttle to the inaugural Plath Conference at the Lilly Library. It is a great pleasure today to be joined to join Peter and the esteemed biographer, Heather Clark, who will be here, um, whose work has introduced readers to a more rigorous, serious image of Plath and her career, as well as renowned writers, actors, and activists. Kathleen Shelfon, in particular, I saw perform in Wit, written by Smithy Margaret Edson in London in 2000, and later learned that she is the mother of David Shelfon from my longtime favorite and Northampton-based band, The Neals. So there's lots of plath roots in our day and wonderfully curated and hosted. Um, 23 years later, it is an honor to be co-editing the poems of Sylvia Plath with Karen V. Kukiel, a scholar of the highest caliber. Over 40 years have passed since the publication of Plath's collected poems. This is the clicker for slides. Just one. We're not ready yet, but I'm just getting ready. Um, <laughs> In the years since, the unabridged journals edited by Kukiel and then two volumes of Plath Letters edited by Peter K. Steinberg and Kukiel have been published. A wealth of scholarship and resources now make possible the approximate dating and ordering of over 500 poems compared with the 274 in the collected poems volume. Readers of the poems of Sylvia Plath, that's what we're calling our volume, ideally gain a more nuanced understanding of Plath's development as a writer and an even more complex sense of her ambitiousness and determination to publish so much throughout her lifetime. Complementing the work of biographers from Paul Alexander's groundbreaking treatment of Plath's early years in Rough Magic to Heather Clark's recent magisterial volume, Red Comet, a new generation will study Plath's attention to craft beginning at an early age. Plath was born in, I thought I should have some bookmarks and biography here for those who maybe have never Googled. Um, <laughs> Plath was born in 1932 in Boston and died in 1963 in London. Her earliest known poem dates from 1937 at about five years old. As Alexander discusses, she created early anthologies of her work and one notebook is held with other juvenilia in the Morgan Library, which you can go over and see. The New York Public Library also has some juvenilia, and the bulk of Plath's early materials are at the Lilly Library. The bulk of Plath's later materials are at Smith, and there's some of each in both places as well. Um, some of you may know Plath's manuscripts um, at Smith's. For instance, Plath and Hughes often wrote on the backs of each other's work, especially later, Plath pointedly decided to use Hughes's draft of the calm to start her poem, Daddy. And thanks to the letters, we now know that 
Hughes finally vacated and left, took his things and left, and Plath wrote Daddy the next day. <laughs> There's a lot more we know from the letters now, um, and it is an invaluable contribution to literary history. I like to start with this slide when I'm teaching because it shows how Plath used the space of the page, and that is she used almost all of it. Um, she was economical when it came to paper. Some of you know she stole paper. Um, she, she robbed the history department supply closet when she was at Smith's teaching in the spring of 1958. Um, this is the pink Smith memorandum paper that she used. It's not torn like that. The, uh, the scan of this is something you can see on your own. It's available from the British Library. It's, the original is at Smith. But the British Library made available a handful of scans of their own content and stuff that's at Smith. And I love to make these um, scans available to students because they're high quality. Um, but you can see here some of her outline for the second half of the bell jar. And on the back, there's actually a passage from the, from the bell jar. So <laughs> she's recycling as she's drafting. Um, and you can see some of how she used the space of the page. It's even folded. My own work, as I was mentioning, dealt with Plath's library. And so this immersion in her materiality and material culture and her archive has provided a springboard for the poems project. And as I was going to show you today, some of my examples um, that I'm going to show you dovetail with things in Plath's library. Um, so Plath's materiality and the context that inform her work are very much at the center of our edition of the poems, partially because there is so much to see and so much that has art been discovered. Um, not all poets have this vast material resource. So that was Plath Smith dorm room during her senior year. When I asked students, they do not have this many books now, except Smith students. They always say they do. Um, so I'm very proud to be a research affiliate at Smith where the students have lots and lots of books. Uh, but, but when I first encountered this image in Plath's scrapbook, to me, it let me date certain items because you could tell by this point Plath had these books. And the books themselves are held by Indiana University, Smith College, and Emory University, and a few in scattered other places. You can also see at the upper right-hand corner an artifact that some of you may know as the earthenware head. Because <laughs> Plath, um, her classmate, made a... Um, bust of her head as an art project. And then Plath, when it was time to go to England, brought it with her because, you know, when you can only bring so much luggage, you always bring a sculpture of your own head. Um, <laughs> and, and when Hughes saw this, he was like, we're not having this. So, he, so they decided to leave it in a tree. And like so many things in Plath's life, it made its way into a poem because so much of the material that surrounded Plath was not just material for poems, but, but life material became material for poems. And this is physically life material in that it is an image of her own head. There's a very good article by Langdon Hammer about it, and he says that when she leaves that head in a tree in Cambridge, she's in a way leaving her Smith self behind. But in a way, she never really does. She's a quintessential student to the end. And you can also see two images of Plath here, this one that she drew um, during her first or second year of college, and the other one is later. And so they bookend in certain ways the time that it was in the bell jar and uh, that she later depicted as being in the bell jar. And they have a certain consistency and formality in the hairstyle that is very much a part of the time, too. Keeping an eye on time. So as we've been working on the collected poems, we have worked with Plath's publications. Plath pu sought to publish almost everything. <laughs> she, she loved sending things out. She loved keeping detailed records. This is the cover of the Philippian, which was the publication of Alice L. Phillips Junior High School in Wellesley Hills, Massachusetts in April 1945. And you can see more issues of the Philippian at the Morgan. One fun thing about this one is it's the Spring Parade issue, and it contained Plath's poem, The Spring Parade. So we, we get a sense, and you'll get a sense in the notes, of some of the context that informed Plath's composition and some of the venues in which she was publishing and writing for publications. She published in nearly every publication of every place she ever was, from the Weedemo megaphone of her summer camp that Peter brought to our attention, to her um, high school newspaper, The Bradford, where she was a co-editor during her senior year. And Smith had a number of publications, and she published in every single one. 
including one that was a publication for faculty when she was, oh, for faculty not just at Smith, but when she was a faculty member as well, and Hughes did too. And you can see Peter's postings about that. It's called the Gray Court Review. But um, I, before arriving at Smith, Plass had published the poem Bitter Strawberries in the Christian Science Monitor, and she had developed a reputation, as Caroline Heilbrunn recounts in The Education of a Woman, Life of a Glorious, Life of Gloria Steinem, from Steinem's vantage point, Plath was legendary. She had written poems in her freshman year, the legend went, which even her professors thought good. Um, all the more reason that we should make these available. Uh, <laughs> and some of them are and have been. Uh, Plath published so much in her lifetime and people have read them in the archives and you can read um, Heather Clark's biography in particular, talks a lot about various early poems. So I wanted to talk a little bit about how we've been dating and ordering some of the materials that we previously had a sense of, but, but needed more of a sense of. Um, so for example, when Plath, uh, you could see at the top there's a header on the TypeScript, and something Karen taught me was to always note all of the headers, because they allow for a certain consistency. So sometimes we were able to determine a batch of poems sent out at a particular time by the header because Plath kept such records that we would know when she sent certain things out. And if we had a date for an earlier version, we then could distinguish which was the later version. And sometimes she would actually rearrange the form of something and sent it out multiple times. So things like headers have been really good, as I like to think of them as tells, like in poker. <laughs> they, um, they're clues. And for this one in particular, it was a fun find because when Plath and the other potential guest editors tried to earn the guest editor role, they did a series of assignments. And in the third assignment, one of the options was to send us several of your best poems, not more than five. And of course, Plath sent five. Um, and, and one of them was Mad Girl's Love Song. As you could see at the top, it says assignment three. And you might think at first that was a school assignment, but it matched this. And, so, and there were f four others with this header. Um, Plath published widely, as I was saying, in publications. Mad Girl's Love Song was also in the Smith Review. Um, conveniently, Plath was also on the board of the Smith Review. Um, you can see at the top, she, uh, that's from the Smith Review, and below it is the press board. And one fun thing about this particular yearbook during Plath's junior year is it had a Canterbury Tales theme. You get a sense of the literary climate. Um, so I was going to show a few examples of poems that intersect with Plath's library because uh, that's my area, um, but also how it shows Plath's own lines circulating in the same literary economy as her reading. So here, when she was reading Portrait of a Lady, she wrote lines from her own poem that later became admonitions in the margin. And if you're just looking at it quickly, you might think that James is alluding to something, but actually James was alluding to Plath. And so um, she sees echoes of Gilbert Osmond in, this in these two lines from her poem. And she published that poem in the Smith Review, and it had an epigraph from Paradise Lost. And in her copy of Paradise Lost, she also wrote the title of her poem. She was very thorough. Her copy of Shakespeare was edited by none other than William Allen Nielsen, who some of you know his name graces the library that holds class papers, a later edition. Uh, but it was a special thing then to, I assume, to be working with an edition edited by two Smith faculty members. When she was revisiting Romeo and Juliet during her senior year, I believe, she actually wrote the title of one of her poems, Apparel for April, that she wrote during her senior year in the margin of Shakespeare's line, Apparelled April. And to have Shakespeare alluding to you, I mean, that's as good as it gets. And so, <laughs> or vice versa. So some of you know that Plastral Paper, I mentioned it earlier, paper has also been a great resource to us um, she stole this paper and it inspired her while she was teaching. The paper was pink. It symbolized all her accomplishments that she had been invited back to Smith to speak, I mean, to teach, and all her accomplishments as a student. And then almost knowing what was coming, she asked for more paper. Uh, in, in the summer of 1962, and this is in the letters, she wrote to her teacher, Alfred Young Fisher, and this, she wrote the bulk of the poems that she's famous for in October. So this was a bit before that, almost as if she knew she had to stock up. Uh, this paper was on 
she used it for the bell jar, and this is another scan that's available from the British Library. And then she turned it over to write the aerial poems. This is an example that was published in the Grow Your Club catalog for an exhibition, an exhibition I helped with as a graduate student and was curated by Karen B. Kukiel and Stephen C. Ennis. And you can see at the top there um, is Hughes's draft of the play, The Calm, and then she has turned it over to write Daddy. Um, one other really fun part for me has been watermarks. Um, some of you know about watermarks. And um, in a secret, she says, the secret is stamped on you, faint, undulant watermark. Um, in the bell jar, when Esther goes to write a novel, she counts out 350 sheets of caraceable bond from her mother's stock in the hall closet. Aurelia Plath taught secretarial skills, so Plath had a cache of office resources in her, at her disposal, and she does write to Aurelia for paper at different times. Caraceable bond, does anyone remember it? <gasps> oh my goodness, let's talk later. So, Caraceable Bond, the gimmick was that it was erasable. So you could erase it just once, and we can see that on some of Plath's pages. Um, and that's one thing, too, about using the originals, is you can actually see where it was erased. But that's the watermark. It was made in the Berkshires, about 40 minutes from Smith, and they actually advertise in the Smith newspaper. The, um, on the left, there is a, a um, verse to the tune probably of Embraceable You by Irish and George Gershwin from 1931. And I thank Elise Graham for bringing that to my attention when I was so excited that I posted all these things on Facebook. Um, <laughs> so some of these papers have helped us to date certain things because she was using that caraceable bond mostly at Smith. There are different papers from different moments. So when she would send certain things out at the same time, often the paper matches. And I learned that from Lawrence Rainey, the T.S. Eliot scholar, who used Eliot's letters to date when Eliot bought his bond paper and figure out the order of the composition of the wasteland. Um, later on, she did, when she was living in England, she asked Aurelia Plath for more paper. She said, there's no caraceable. And she probably sent it because she says on the right, I have really been ripping through the caraceable bond. And there are, is paper from Plath's Cambridge time on the Craceable Bond. And then another paper, type of paper she used was Abermill Bond, and she uses this in England and after. Um, her paper was valuable, as Karen Kukiel uh, has emphasized. This is how she knew it was valuable. She sold a sheaf to, of 100 poems to a dealer who then placed them at, the, at Indiana University, and it provided the start, starting point of their Plath collection. Interestingly, the figure of $280 is roughly $2,826.68 in 2023. So that was a lot of cash um, for one supporting her, seeking to support herself by her writing. I was also, I was also gonna share one last find. I think I'm okay on time. Um, and Peter helped us find this. Um, some of you know the material antecedents for many of Plath's poems, uh, one of which is she wrote a poem called The Hanging Man that has many sources, and the actual poem itself describes, um, su is suggestive too of things like electric shock treatment. But one source for the title of the poem is the tarot, which Plath read avidly. And this is her tarot book that she bought in 1956 in England, and it has The Hanged Man. Then later, while she was teaching at Smith, she audited an art course with Priscilla Vanderpoel in the spring of 1958. She then wrote a series of art poems that many of you may know. But she also noted in her journal that Vanderpoel possesses an admirable, huge Baskin hanging man. And it's interesting, she calls it hanging, like the title of her poem, it's an interesting slippage, because Baskin called it hanged. Um, and it could be inspired by many things. Um, and it was from 1955, two years before he met Plath and Hughes. And the original is weathered, as you see, because um, it was held by Smith College all this time. And Peter helped us find, figure that out because he asked me if Vanderpool had any heirs, and she did not. So she gave her collection to Smith, and we found it. And Karen and I went to see it. And it's weathered because Smith hung it in the boathouse. Um, <laughs> but um, we went to see it up close. And one thing I really like about it is that even though um, it was made before Plath and Hughes were ever arrived on the scene, it kind of has Hughes hair. Um, but you can't really. <laughs> so maybe, I don't know for sure that they saw it, but Hughes does later write about this um, 
this woodcut, and um, so he at least knew it via Plath, maybe knowing it, and maybe via Baskin, but um, it is an interesting material antecedent. The art Plath admired, the paper on which she typed, and the book she annotated introduced many textures that informed her engagement with language. Visually, the watermarks and woodcuts remind us, as Karen Kukiel has discussed regarding Bloomsbury correspondence, that another story exists behind the words, one that sheds new light on Plath's composition history. Editing Plath has meant approaching the making and unmaking of poems and the ways that, with each line, Plath too sought to understand poetry and its potential. Thank you. Peter K. Steinberg is the co-editor of The Col Collected Writings of Asia Wevel, a book which was presented with the Popular Culture Association's Susan Kopelman Award for the Best Anthology, Multi-Authored, or Edited Book in Feminist Studies in Popular and American Culture. He is co-editor of the two-volume Letters of Sylvia Plath, co-author of These Ghostly Archives, The Unearthing of Sylvia Plath, and author of Sylvia Plath. Steinberg has authored several articles and introductions on Plath, which have appeared in Notes and Queries and Fine Books and Collections, among others. He is under contract with Favorite, Faber and Faber to edit a book entitled The Prose of Sylvia Plath, scheduled to be published in September 2024. Please welcome Peter K. Steinberg. Um, I'd like to thank Paul Alexander for organizing the Sylvia Plath Symposium. Uh, to recognize Plath in 2023 and Hunter College and the Roosevelt House for hosting this event. And thank you to anyone who's joining on Zoom as well. It's great to have you all here. It is a certain kind of wonderful to speak about Plath's novel, The Bell Jar, in the neighborhood where, in June 1953, she lived, worked, and explored. In an April 1954 letter to her then boyfriend, Gordon LeMayer, Plath discussed the prospects of working a job against her desire to write creatively and said, but from my experience last June, June of 1953, I discovered that my daily work took all my creativity out of me and replaced it with weariness and a desire to relax over a drink, a dance, a show, or just plain go to bed. When I tried to write, I kept thinking, if I wanna get ahead, I'll have to turn to my job reports. Why am I sacrificing valuable time to trying to write? I was either too tired or too guilty to write, and my job was certainly not the subject for a novel. Clearly, she changed her mind. <laughs> Plath first tried to write about her experiences that she later fine-tuned in the bell jar during her senior year at Smith College, about a year after she attempted suicide in August of 1953. She wrote the story, Tongues of Stone, for Alfred Kazan's short story writing class, completing it by early January 1955. Also that month, Plath wrote the poem, Morning in the Hospital Solarium. Shortly after she married, in June 1956, Plath wrote the poem, Miss Drake Proceeds to Supper. She noted this composition in her pocket diary, saying that it was composed in Sun by Seine in Paris. The Miss Drake of the poem reappears in the novel as Miss Norris in chapter 15. Plath also drew some shoes that many liken to Esther's same size seven patent leather shoes, which she purchased at Bloomingdale's. And I'd like to point out the notation of the bell jar on there doesn't necessarily indicate that they were purchased uh, at Bloomingdale's, it, it was uh, included in uh, Lois Ames's afterward to the novel in, in America. It wasn't, um, there was no afterward to the novel in, in England. Other works of poetry and prose exist that Plath would use, like a palimpsest in the bell jar, including Suicide Off Egg Rock, Two Views of a Cadaver Room, and In the Mountains, which she rewrote as a piece called The Christmas Heart. In early 1961, Sylvia Plath experienced two traumas. She suffered a miscarriage in February, and early the next month, she had her appendix out, which required a week-long hospitalization. 
after her release, she wrote two poems set in hospitals, tulips and in plaster. This appendix operation was Plath's longest stay in the hospital since her five month recovery after her suicide attempt. I believe this stay had a profound impact on her and led to the novel's creation. Tulips shares similar lines and imagery to a scene in the, in the bell jar. And plaster is ostensibly about someone Plath was nearby during her appendectomy. And Plath writes about her in, in her hospital notes uh, appendi uh, in the appendix of uh, the journals. But Plath's leg break in December 1952, recreated in the bell jar, mind you, and experience in a cast herself definitely adds authenticity to the speaker of the poem. And then in late March 1961, Plath wrote the poem, I Am Vertical. In this poem, she repeats words, with one exception, verbatim, in the scene with Marco the Peruvian at the Forest Hills Country Club. Sylvia Plath was a self-plagiarizer. The exact start date for the novel is unknown. However, Plath was a third of the way through it by the time she noted the following in a letter to her college friend, Anne David O. Goodman, on the 27th of April, 1961. Plath wrote, I have been wanting to do this for about 10 years, which is kind of a lie, because uh, it was only eight years, uh, but had a terrible block about writing a novel. Then, suddenly, in beginning negotiations with a New York publisher for an American edition of my poems, the dikes broke and I stayed awake all night, seized by fearsome excitement, saw how it should be done, started the next day, and go every morning to my borrowed study as to an office and belt out more of it. I'll have to publish it under a pseudonym if I ever get it accepted, because it's so chock full of real people, I'd be sued to death and all my mother's friends wouldn't speak to her because they are all taken off. Anyhow, I've never been so excited about anything. It's probably god awful, but it's so funny and yet serious, it makes me laugh. That's a nice authorial comment on the novel. Plath had been in negotiations, as she termed it, since early April with Judith Jones of Knopf. Smith College holds Plath's outline, as Amanda showed us earlier, this is the, the full thing um, uh, for the novel, which is a fascinating document. Here you can see Plath putting check marks next uh, by those people and incidents which she put in the novel. By the 19th of August, 1961, Plath wrote to her brother-in-law, I am trying to finish a first novel before we move and will make an effort to get it published to see if I can scare up some carpet money. Three days later, Plath annotated a journal entry from 1958 in which she asked herself, why don't I write a novel? Her annotation reads, I have. August 22nd, 1961, The Bell Jar. Plath submitted The Bell Jar to just one British publisher that we know of, Heinemann who had produced her first volume of poems, The Colossus, in 1960. It is not known when she submitted it. An archivist for Heinemann's records, held by the Random House Group UK, told me that the contract for the bell jar was dated the 21st of October, 1961, and that the author has delivered the manuscript of the work. That's, that's just six months from when she had started drafting the novel in April, which is pretty incredible. By November 1961, concerns with her editor, James Mitchie. Smith College holds some papers that show Plath working through these issues. In these three worksheets, we see Plath tracking text from her final typescript draft. She cleaned it up a bit when she sent a list of changes to be made in a letter to her editor. Heinemann intended to print the bell jar in 1962 but acceded to Plath's request to push back publication so that she could obtain all the money she was awarded by a Saxton grant, which ran from November 1961 to November 1962. Plath received her proof of the book in July 1962, in the early days of the turmoil over her husband's affair with Assia Wevel. 
The novel was published on Monday, the 14th of January, 1963. The initial print run was 2,000 copies, so if you have one, you have a rare book. Plath received her advanced finished copy of the novel in mid-December of 1962. Within a month of Plath's death, her estate authorized Heinemann to disclose the true identity of the author of The Bell Jar, and Heinemann themselves reprinted the book almost immediately. In case you're curious, there are nearly 90 real experiences in The Bell Jar, from which Plath drew for the telling of Esther Greenwood's story. The bulk of these real experiences were from 1951 to 1953, as you might imagine, during, the, during her college years. But the earliest is from 1943, and the latest is from 1960. Plath was very clever in the, manip in the manipulation of her own experiences. On the screen is one such example. This is a clipping from the Boston Globe which ran during her first suicide attempt, showing Plath with her mother and brother in their Wellesley backyard, to which Plath refers in chapter 16. There are a number of typographical changes in current editions of The Bell Jar, published by Faber in the UK and HarperCollins in the US. Two examples from the 2019 Faber edition are the phrase, color of skin on page five, uh, to describe Doreen's nightgown, changed to the color of sin. And the doctor's given you a nin injection on page 43, now reads, the doctor's given you an injection. The color of skin and the color of sin are very different things. Skin suggests the sheerness of nudity. Sin is usually represented by black or red. And Plath's original ninjection gave the nurse who spoke it a New Yorkish dialect. The US edition was never published the way Plath intended, and there are some truly baffling edits. In chapter five, Esther is feeling rather sorry for herself in the Amazon Hotel, modeled off the former Barbizon Hotel, located just a few blocks from here, as Amanda pointed out earlier. The British edition reads, as I lay there in my white hotel, am I on the right slide? Yeah. As I lay there in my white hotel bed feeling lonely and weak, I thought of Buddy Willard lying even lonelier and weaker than I was up in that sanatorium in the Adirondacks. And I felt like a heel of the worst sort. The American edition reads, as I lay there in my white hotel bed feeling lonely and weak, I thought I was up in that sanatorium in the Adirondacks and felt like a heel of the worst sort. What's missing is the phrase of Buddy Willard lying even lonelier and weaker than. Removing this phrase strips Esther of compassionate feelings towards her just about almost ex-boyfriend. It also makes her feel uh, appear more selfish. When Harper Collins issued their 25th anniversary edition in 1996, they did a couple of weird things. There are two places in chapter one where the editors wrapped some of Esther's thoughts in parentheses. The first instance is the entire paragraph that begins, I knew something was wrong with me that summer because all I could think about was the Rosenbergs. The second is the sentence, I felt very still and very empty the way the eye of a tornado must feel moving dully along in the middle of the surrounding hullabaloo. I suppose the intention here is to easily denote or internalize Greenwood's thoughts as a way to perhaps signal to modern day readers that Esther Greenwood is thinking. However, these kinds of thoughts and comments by Esther carry on throughout the novel, and yet there are only two places where this was done. It is my ardent hope that the publishers will revert their texts and restore the bell jar to the novel that Plath approved. One of the component pieces of my work on the letters of Sylvia Plath involved identifying in notes the dates of composition and of publication of Plath's creative writings that she mentioned to her family, friends, and professional contacts. As part of this, I acquired copies of these works and transcribed them. I did this because it gave me a better familiarity with the pieces 
and allowed me to have full text searching capabilities. What developed, I, I was in college I was a C minus student, so having a computer to remember everything for me has been ex exceedingly beneficial. What developed as a result of this was a full-fledged manuscript of all of Plath's short prose. From 2015, when this started, until 2022, I worked on my transcriptions to bring them to a final shape. Over these years, I mentioned the project to Frida Hughes, who was interested in seeing it come to fruition. I used the initial months of the pandemic in 2020 to great use by reviewing several times the manuscript. And in late January 2022, I'm happy to say I signed a contract with Faber for the prose of Sylvia Plath. A publication, as China mentioned, thank you, is scheduled for next September 2024. Readers of Plath's journals and letters will come across dozens of references to works which are relatively, if not completely, unknown and thus difficult to access. As well, there are countless references to the desire to write poetry and in several prose genres. The prose of Sylvia Plath will fill out what was left out of 1979's collection entitled Johnny Panic and the Bible of Dreams. It shows Plath, my book, shows Plath to be an indefatigable writer of short fiction, nonfiction, journalism, book reviews, and lest we forget, writings aimed for younger audiences. Johnny Panic printed 23 pieces of short fiction, four works of nonfiction, and some journal entries. Removing the journal entries, that's 27 prose works. Dozens upon dozens of works that Plath published in her lifetime were left out of that book, including the majority of the stories she published in Seventeen magazine, such as And Summer Will Not Come Again, Den of Lions, and The Perfect Setup. Den of Lions won third prize in the magazine short story contest, earning Plath $100. The perfect setup received honorable mention the following year. As to the contents of this forthcoming book, there are more than 75 short stories, over 50 pieces of nonfiction, more than 50 press releases written during her time at Smith College working for the press board. This was when she was covering local events and her pieces were published largely anonymously in the Daily Hampshire Gazette and the Springfield newspapers. Uh, she kept notes, a notebook, and, and a pocket diary, and noting when assignments were due. And using those, I went blind using microfilm trying to find uh, when, when they were published. She also wrote eight book reviews. That is more than 180 works of prose in various genres. As well, there are 31 extant prose fragments, works she created and probably completed but for which there are only a smattering of surviving pages remaining. Compared to what was published in Johnny Panic, and including the recently published short story Mary Ventura and the Ninth Kingdom, just 15% of Plath's prose is widely available for purchase in bookstores or capable of being borrowed from libraries. I cannot tell you how happy it makes me, or how happy it makes me, yeah, to have been trusted by the estate of Sylvia Plath to assist in ushering into print so much of Plath's work. There exists a fluidity within and throughout the works of Sylvia Plath. And when I say works, I mean poetry, prose, letters, and journals. Now that Plath's journals and letters are published in full and complete editions of her poetry and shorter prose are scheduled for publication within the next two years, the next generation of Sylvia Plath readers will gain a fuller and deeper understanding and appreciation for all the creative output of the person we are here to celebrate today. Thank you. Vijay Sashridi was born in Bangalore, India in 1954 and migrated to North America at the age of five. He grew up in the Midwest and was educated at Oberlin College and Columbia University. His collections of poems are Wild Kingdom, The Long Meadow, and Three Sections, and his latest, That Was Then, This Is Now, all from Grey Wolf Press, and The Disappearances, New and Selected Poems from HarperCollins, India. 
He has also published dozens of essays, introductions, memoir fragments, and reviews. He has received grants from the New York Foundation for the Arts, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation. He has been awarded the Paris Review's Bernard F. Connors Long Poem Prize, the McDowell Colonies Fellowship for Distinguished Poetic Achievement, the Academy of American Poets James Laughlin Prize, an Arts and Letters Award in Literature from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, and the 2014 Pulitzer Prize in Poetry. His poetry and prose have appeared in many periodicals in over 50 anthologies. He teaches at Loris Sarah Lawrence College, where he has held the rotating Michelle Tolila Myers Chair in Writing. He lives in Brooklyn. Thank you. And thank you, Paul, for inviting me. And I want to thank uh, Hunter and uh, the Roosevelt House for hosting this. Uh, as you can tell by that introduction, there was no mention of Sylvia Plath. <laughs> and when Paul wrote to me and said he wanted me to participate in this, you know, my first thought was, why me? But I didn't share that thought with him. Uh, because actually, in my own mind, there's a very, very good reason for me to uh, talk about Plath. I've been reading her with increasing fascination for the last 10 or 15 years. And, uh, and I think there's kind of uh, a, uh, a sense in which in relationship to the wonderful scholarship we've heard so far, I feel I do have something to contribute. And that has to do with Plath as a rhetorician. I don't read the scholarship, I don't read the criticism. I dipped into the biographies for a while, and, uh, but I read the poetry endlessly. And uh, I wrote something, and I'm going to read it, and then I'm going to kind of deconstruct it as I'm reading it, and then I'm going to give a close reading of a poem and talk about why I think of her in the way I think of her now. You know, I want to start with another confession, which is I've been reading her poems for almost 50 years, and I always saw in those years the gifts and the power, but it's only been, as I said, in the last couple of decades that she's become someone I think of as one of the supreme poets in the language, great in the ordinary way of literary greatness rather than great in, as a special and peculiar case, great in the way that, say, Rambeau is great or Jane Austen is great or Tolstoy, not because they're classic, but because they're fundamental, because reading them is always new, always a source of endless new thinking and feeling. Their work gives us, a, as Kant says in his ungainly way, a ground of infinite concept formulation. There are reasons I didn't engage with the poems in this way for so long and recognize what they were, though. One reason is this. And, you know, I don't have the wonderful you know, technolo <laughs> technological prowess to do what you guys did, but I, do, I did bring a show and tell thing. This is the 1982 edition, I think, is it? Of, no, it's the 2004 edition, right? The, the facsimile edition of Ariel. And you can see, you can't see, but there's a manuscript page here, too. I do, I also have a manuscript page. <laughs> and... Uh, and it's one of the title pages of Ariel. And Plath, of course, had a hard time finding a title for the book. You know, the, the other titles were, as I remember, you know, The Rival, The Rabbit Catcher, A Birthday Present. And Daddy was considered to be a title, too. That, you know, and here they reprinted on the cover page the, the typescript with Daddy on. And I think this, the daddy there is the reason I sort of uh, stayed away from Plath for a long, long time in the sense that I read her every couple of years, but I didn't dive deeply. I didn't sort of 
use her in the way the poets as opposed to scholars use other poets. You know, we're scholars or unselfish readers, we're very selfish readers. And uh, we just want to get something from the poet for ourselves. And, uh, and I couldn't enter Plath because of that, you know, uh, because of the invitation you can get from the cover of this facsimile edition of Ariel. The invitation is to a characterization of Ariel and of Plath, a certain interpretation, one defined by Daddy, which is probably her most famous and certainly her most notorious poem, and one in which her life story is, if not central, at least unavoidable in appreciating the poems. Books can be written and may already have been about Plath interpretation, Plath historiography, and hermeneutics. And it might be the case that the drama and intensity of her life experience shouldn't be disentangled from our reading of the poems. It wasn't, though, the life experience that it took me a long time to get around as a reader of Plath. It was the invitation in the cover. The invitation the cover offered, the cultural marker it offered. Given my positionality, as they call it these days, I couldn't help but refuse that invitation that appropriation of Plath in my cultural era. And I think even if I had accepted the invitation, I wouldn't have wanted to. So I tended to move sideways in my relationship to her work, and it took me a long time to go around the tremendous vortex of energy that surrounded and still surrounds her presence. Plath the martyr, Plath the icon, Plath the hero, Plath the monster the biography wars, the critical vehemence, the history of recrimination, Plath and her phenomena requiring a phenomenology of its own. Those things deflected my attention. I never felt alienated from the poems or from the poet. I never turned away in shock and horror as Philip Larkin says he did. I feel looking back though a little bitter about the ways in which the intellectual storm surrounding her made me back off. Because if I had read her early as deeply as I should have, instead of sporadically picking her up here and there every couple of years or so, and spending a few hours with her before moving on, I would have learned a tremendous amount. Having said that, I want to read a poem closely to try to convey my own sense of her uniqueness and unexampled quality. And the reasons why I think of her, not in the way I think of Anne Sexton or even Robert Lowell in the middle period Robert Lowell that I continue to read, or even Yeats or Auden or Thomas Tranströmer, but instead think of her in the way I think of Wallace Stevens or Mallarmé. I read her not for her confessionality or her paraphrasability, her history, her closeness to us, but rather for her distance from us, her impenetrability, for the transcendent, ungraspable quality of the artifact she makes. I want to explore that impenetrability a little through the poem I've handed out to make an argument for Platt as an abstract artist whose best work represents only itself, finally, from whatever biographical data it springs. And the poem I uh, printed out for you is The Moon and the Yew Tree. And I'll read it and talk about it a little bit. The Moon and the Yew Tree. This is the light of the mind, cold and planetary. The trees of the mind are black, the light is blue. The grasses unload their griefs on my feet as if I were God, prickling my ankles and murmuring of their humility. Funny spiritus mists inhabit this place, separated from my house by a row of headstones. I simply cannot see where there is to get to. The moon is no door. It is a face in its own right. White as a knuckle and terribly upset. It drags the sea after it like a dark crime. It is quiet, with the O oh, gape of complete despair. I live here, 
Twice on Sunday, the bells startle the sky. Eight great tongues affirming the resurrection. At the end, they soberly bong out their names. The yew tree points up, it has a gothic shape. The eyes lift after it and find the moon. The moon is my mother. She is not sweet like Mary. Her blue garments unloose small bats and owls. How I would like to believe in tenderness, the face of the effigy, gentled by candles, bending on me in particular, its mild eyes. I have fallen a long way. Clouds are flowering, blue and mystical over the face of the stars. Inside the church, the saints will be all blue, floating on their delicate feet over the cold pews, their hands and faces stiff with holiness. The moon sees nothing of this. She is bald and wild. And the message of the yew tree is blackness, blackness and silence. A good definition of poetry, I think, is that it transforms the noise of experience into silence, you know, and forces us to inhabit a certain kind of silence. Another good definition of poetry, I think, I tend to come up with definitions for my students because they like them, you know, is that poetry is language where the ratio of implied meaning to explicit meaning is sufficiently high. You know, in the poetry that I would say characterizes most of the last 100, 120 years, that, you know, which I would call symbolist poetry. And a lot of the the poetic schools we think about in the West revolve in some way or respond in some way to the symbolism of the late 19th century. You know, certainly Yeats does, Pound and Eliot do. And, uh, and that kind of impulse to fully create a symbolic world, you know, a world that doesn't refer to anything but itself is something that Plath, I think, is primarily engaged in. And the engagement becomes really clear when you look at the rhetoric, when you think about the rhetoric independently of the circumstances of the life. You know, I mean, I think there's a contamination of Plath's biography and the poetry, you know, a mutual contamination which criticism of Plath going forward is going to have to deal with and think about in relationship to thinking about the enormous effect she's had and the influence she's had on the culture as being a kind of cultural icon. And, you know, and I think for me, it took me a long time, as I said, to get to Plath simply because of that contamination. And, uh, and when I finally did, what I found was someone of extraordinary craftsmanship who was also in the process of making monuments, monumental artifacts, things that had a lightness but a sort of density, you know, a kind of, you know, a density that was almost prehistoric in their quality. And this poem is, I think, a classic example. You know, one of the aspects of this poem I think is very important is that it is written by a prose writer, you know. That's a speculation. That's a, a kind of a leap, but it's a leap that's really justified when you look at the sentence making and the consciousness of the sentence making here, you know. The, the specificity of the subject verb noun structure and the repetition of that and the constant solidification of the sentence as it's moving down the page you feel that you're in the presence of someone who's very very conscious of what the prose sentence does 
and understands that there is a difference between the prose sentence and the poetic sentence and makes that difference extremely sharp. Now, this is the light of the mind, cold and planetary, boom. The trees of the mind are black, boom. The light is blue. There's a sort of drawing back from what is characteristic of the English sentence, which is its headlong quality, its prolixity, the fact that there, you know, because of the Latinity of the English sentence, the English sentence has historically provided us with, as poets with many ways in which to create sentential architecture, right? You know, I mean, the classic example of this is Ye, or is, is Henry James, right? And in some sense, the prose of, say, Gertrude Stein and through Gertrude Stein Hemingway is a reaction to the Jamesian sentence to the sentence that's complex syntactically, that's hypotactic rather than paratactic. And Plath here is very, very conscious of what the sentence is and what she wants to do with it, which is very different than what's been done with it. You know, the only person she resembles at this period of American poetry is Theodore Rutke, whom she read. You know, the other person she read, of course, was Dylan Thomas. You know, but Dylan Thomas is is extremely promiscuous in his use of sentential structure. You know, Plath she gets a lot from Thomas. She gets a lot of her kind of. Uh, her really unusual individuated meta metaphor making from Thomas, but she has her own way about managing the poem as it's going down the page. And that way, you know, for me as a poet, that's like the most exciting thing about her. To look at this poet who was writing 70 years ago now, you know, these poems, and who had thought through all of these things that I came to as problems, you know, after long labor and confusion, she had arrived at an understanding of certain rhetorical choices and how she had to make them that uh, seems to, seemed to me so advanced and kind of so extraordinary. And I, you know, and I think we're just at the beginning of understanding those aspects of Plath. You know, but I'll keep going with the poem. You know, just look at the sentences, but then look what she's doing. This is the light of the mind, cold and planetary. You know, going from the microcosmic to the macrocosmic, the trees of the mind are black, the light is blue. It's very interesting that she establishes the color scheme right there. You know, and she also gives us a frame and a very important frame, the very important frame is that this is happening in the mind, right? But what's even more interesting and what's so compelling and subtle about this poem is that she does the same sort of trick that Flaubert does in Madame Bovary. In Madame Bovary, Flaubert starts out with a first person narrator, you know, a fellow student of Charles Bovary when Charles Bovary comes into school at the very beginning. And the fellow student describes Charles Bovary and then is abandoned. You know, that Flaubert, with a kind of majestic Parnassian sense of his own power as a narrator and his own freedom in relationship to his own devices, completely abandons that and assumes the position of an omniscient narrator. And this is what Plath is doing here. She's telling us that this is the mind, but then she totally abandons that conceit as she gets deeper and deeper into the poem. And we go along with her, you know, and, and that betrays, I think, a supreme confidence that she has at this point in her writing. I mean, this is one of those poems that she wrote in that miraculous November, right? which is like Keats's miraculous April when he wrote the great odes in one month, you know, and, uh, you know, this is that November before the, 
the freeze sets in and, you know, like that horrible winter she must have experienced. And uh, so uh, she, ke she sort of slowly moves out of, she quickly moves out of like the frame and into the constant repetition of the end stopped lines and the solidity of the stanza making Fumi spiritus mists inhabit this place, you know, and that's a uh, that's a meteorological line. It tells us what time of the night it is. You know, it's actually the early morning when the mists start rising. You know, the the tree is black, but the sky is blue, but the moon is there, and of course the moon is as important to Sylvia Plath as the sun is to Wallace Stevens. You know, the, the kind of, the, a lot of the poems, even when the moon is not mentioned, are moonlit in some way. And, you know, and then she, she, she lays out the mise-en-scene so carefully, right? Separated from my house by a row of headstones, I simply cannot see where there is to get to. So the scene is set, the cinematic situation is established, and the metaphor making is foregrounded by the oversimplification of the writing, the determined oversimplification of the writing, the determined oversimplification of the line making. Yeah. Then the moon is no door, it is a face in its own right. This could be a uh, a motto for her poetry, right? You know, uh, you know the the title "Daddy" on this volume is a, soar, a, a door inviting us into an interpretation. You know, but for her, her poems are her poems. They don't necessarily have anything to do with you know the terrible life that she's living. Of course. She can't quite separate those things, but I think when she's sitting down, and we all know from the manuscript pages, right, how sedulous Plath was in terms of revision, construction, thoughtfulness in her writing, you know, how supremely conscious she was. You know, white as a knuckle and terribly upset, it drags the sea after it like a dark crime. It is quiet with the O gape of complete despair. I live here twice on Sunday. The bells startle the sky. Eight great tongues affirming the resurrection. At the end, they soberly bong out their names. You know, I mean, I could go into great detail about how the metaphor making is folded in so beautifully to the writing. You know, I mean, it's just extraordinary what a powerful metaphor maker she was. Know, how powerful she was with all the great master tropes of rhetoric, metonymy, synecdoche, metaphor, irony, but I don't think I have time. But so, you know, at the end, they soberly bong out their names. The yew tree points up, it has a gothic shape. The eyes lift after it and find the moon. The moon is my mother. It's not the religious imagery. It's not the pagan imagery, it's not the natural imagery, but the way in which all of these elements, just like the elements of her biography, her condition, her despair, are subordinate to the act of making here. And the act of making is incredibly positive and dynamic in each one of these cases. It has this degree of control, of self-satisfaction, and satisfaction it provides to the reader, which is really quite extraordinary. You can read and read and read this poem and never feel yourself to have gotten to the bottom of it. Yeah. And her small balloon garments unloose small bats and owls. How I would like to believe in tenderness. Okay, here is something that a lesser poet would try to make into a very big turn, right? She doesn't do that. She backs away from it. It becomes a part of the general movement, the creation of the monument, right? The creation of the Stonehenge-like structure that is this poem, you know? How I would like to believe in its tenderness. And there are m many, many vocal 
achievements and realizations that make that possible. You know, I mean, she sounds like no one else in the same way that Wallace Stevens sounds no one like no one else. You know, you can read a poet like, say, the Robert Lowell of Near the Ocean, and feel that he quite consciously has Yeats behind him. You know, you don't really feel that there's anyone behind her in terms of the vocables, in terms of the sonic control, in terms of the sonic choices she's making. You know, the, the instinct she has for her own uniqueness is extraordinary here, you know. And so she doesn't overplay her hand in this penultimate stanza. The face of the effigy gentled by candles bending on me in particular its mild eyes. And then I have fallen a long way there, too, we have a big moment made small, a big moment made to conform to the creation of silence, which is the final activity of this poem. Clouds are flowering, blue and mystical, over the face of the stars inside the church. The saints will all be all blue floating on their delicate feet over the cold pews, their hands and faces stiff with holiness. The moon sees nothing of this. She is bald and wild, and the message of the yew tree is blackness, blackness and silence. So uh, I have more, but we have to stop. <laughs> Because I know I certainly do. Can you tell us what happened with the the, um, the rejection of the bell jar at Kanaf? Because Judith Jones, I don't know if anyone has watched Julia yeah. lately, where she's like this hero <laughs> all the way, helping Julia out and heroically editing, you know, John Updike. Right. But how was she with Plath? The... The back history of the bell jar in America was one that Plath had written in letters that she never wanted the novel to be published here, in part mm -hmm. because she didn't want her mom to read it or, and, and some of the other people that she took off, to quote her. Uh, but the ironic thing is that she actively did try, she and Heidemann actively did market the book to American publishers, um, probably because she needed a lot of carpets for her house in Court <laughs> Green for that carpet money. Um, Ultimately, it was rejected by Knopf and Harper and Rowe, as they were called then. Um, Judith Jones had written a letter to Plath in uh, December of 1962, I believe, stating that she wanted, basically they wanted to publish the book, but they just weren't convinced by the story. They weren't convinced at the experiences that Plath related in Esther Greenwood's story, they didn't, they didn't understand how, how they were that awful that, led, that it led to Esther's trying to kill herself. So they, they just felt like the story didn't really hold, hold up, and they, they just couldn't see how it I've always wondered it who it was maybe behind it. Was it Blanche Knopf? Was it a she, There are decision? some letters at the Ransom Center at University of Texas at Austin. Um, Blanche has one or two, or I, I remember seeing her name on a couple of them, but it was mostly she was dealing with Judith directly. You know, there was an editor who turned down Catcher in the Rye. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there was also an editor yeah. who turned down the bell jar. Yeah. It, yeah. It's a thing that yeah. happens. <laughs> yeah. They hopefully, you know, they have some regrets. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Since how many copies does it sell? Do we have any idea? I can never get uh, Harper and Rowe to tell me. I, there are, there are definitely yeah. three commas in the number. That's all yeah. I know. Hmm. Yeah. Questions? Yes, sir. All red in the Plath canon, so light be upbeat. In the positive in the prose, way. I mean, I'm I'm more versed right now in the prose than I am the poems. Um, 
I mean, a lot of her, her letters have some pretty witty yeah, the um, are <laughs> instances. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, there, there are definitely lighter pieces. I mean, the nonfiction uh, material that she was writing in her prose is certainly, it's serious, but it is a little lighthearted. Um, you know, certainly not as intense as a Lady Lazarus or a Daddy or something like that. Um, so maybe dark comedy in the poetry, dark <laughs> irony maybe? The poetry, if you read the restored aerial that CJ was holding, there's actually transcripts in the back of all of the poems as they were left. And Plath eliminated a lot of exclamation points as she moved closer and closer to, or as the manuscript progressed. So originally it might have had a very different tone. I think she was a master of irony. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I think you can't really appreciate her without understanding how ironic some of those poems are. Mm -hmm. You know, and even a poem like Daddy. Everyone how, adores a fashion. Every woman adores a fashion. Right. I mean, what does she mean by that? Yeah. You know, and, uh, and people have been taking that literally. You know, the word irony, of course, means, comes from the Greek for lying, basically, dissembling, you know, and, uh, and she's dissembling all the time and dissembling with great precision, you know, and, uh, I don't know if that's funny, though. I don't know, you know. Well, sometimes you can. I mean, it makes you smile, but I don't know what kind <laughs> yeah. of smile that is. I don't know so. if that's what he's talking about, though. Yes, yes. Yeah. One of the excerpts that Amanda presented actually had her referring to the fact that it was a source of amusement to her in the bell jar that she specifically says. Obviously, it's going to be... A, also a source of tremendous pain to her mother, and she was able to overlook that. And it was a source of tremendous pain to her mother, who wound up living in a senior residence for 10 years with Buddy Willard's family. By the way, this is Richard Larchon, who's one of Mrs. Plath's best friends. Sorry, a great deal at the end of her I met, uh, I, Mrs. Plath took me to a dinner. It was at your home, wasn't it? Yeah. You have, That, of how they changed it. I mean, I feel like I'd rather read the first one. Is that her original work? Yeah. But like the editor just takes yeah for the bell. Yeah, I mean, I, I actually read um, side by side different copies of the bell jar, noting I have no children, so I have time. <laughs> um, and I read side by side copies of the the proof of the bell jar against the first edition. And the first edition was my control copy because that was the one that she approved of. Um, and then I read it against the 1971 Harper and Rowe edition and then the 1996 Harper and Rowe uh, 25th anniversary edition. Just to most of the differences uh, you can understand with spelling, you know, British spell, the British spell the word color with a U, we don't. So there were a lot of things like that, pine paneled might have one L in one edition and two L's in the other edition. Those are very slight changes. That's the majority of the typographical differences between them. But then that missing phrase in that one scene where, she, where she's in the Barbizon or the Amazon um, really jumped out at me when I, when I read it is I just can't figure out why they would do it. And I did ask Faber and Faber more recently about those two changes, the color of skin and sin, and ninjection and injection. And they were like, well, yeah, we're just going to let it stand, um, which I don't, I don't agree with. Um, and I think, I mean, to a certain degree, the editorial history of Plath is, has been very interesting. Uh, at first, it was probably too close to home because it was the estate that was doing it. And ever since they reached out to Karen in, in the late 90s to do the journals, 
they have released some of that control and let sort of outside people make the editorial decisions. And I think that's why we are now getting more um, faithful uh, editions of Plath's work because we are sort of a step removed from people who were probably too close to it to begin with. We have time for one more question. Um, I just wanted to go back to the comic point. There's an anecdote told by one of Plath's London friends of Plath coming to her house and reading Daddy to her, and the two women burst into giggles at the end of the poem. <laughs> so I, I think that it's an interesting take on a poem that's usually read as a poem of rage, a um, poem of anger, and um, it seems to be a, a st an anecdote about the irreducible um, meaning of a poetic work. I, I think you have to read a lot of those lines with irony. Okay, that's all we have time for. We're going to take a half hour break. We'll come back at 11.30 for panel number two. And thank our panelists again, please.